So welcome to Three Steps to, to Kayaking. Uh, this show is being recorded and this is one of a series of tracks, Zoom Away Blue Friday calls. And uh, I am hailing from Vancouver Island, British Columbia on the wild wet west coast. I'm a longtime track pilot, a sea kayaker and director of development with Track Kayaks. So I'm super proud to be here and connecting with you as the, as the audience uh, of this program. This is the Three Steps to Kayaking. It's a virtual community gathering really designed to help motivated enthusiasts develop as proficient sea kayakers. It's hosted by our Cracker Jack team of track pilots, uh, sometimes me, sometimes others. But this program is designed to help support you getting into the support of sea kayaking or take your practice to the next level. Uh, we'll focus on three basic steps to help you set a solid foundation uh, on which anyone can develop with greater competence and confidence. So the rotation of the three steps include understanding the tools required to get in, um, like the right gear for paddling that you'll be doing. Also, it includes skills development to help ensure that you're developing solid habits uh, that can lead to more successful skills progression and a sea personship to help understand best practices in the dynamic environment of the sea and sea kayaking. So we invite you to eddy out with us. I thank you, our guests here, for uh, joining us today to eddy out with other like-minded community members uh, to discuss the topics that we love most. And so our aim is really to support constant and never-ending improvement. Uh, with the Three Steps to Kayaking podcast, we're gonna point to three things. We're gonna share knowledge, tools, and gear to equip uh, needed to get you on the water. We're going to help you gain skills for building more confidence and competence as a sea kayaker, and we're going to develop your sea personship for more fun and safe and rewarding experiences. So uh, welcome to this program. I got a really special guest here uh, today. Today's subject is preparing for winter paddling, and so I'm going to take a moment just to cover a few uh, housekeeping notes. Uh, you are on Zoom. Uh, you will be muted just for this recording, but at the end of this, we're going to be able to open up the mics and, uh, and engage in more of a community discussion and certainly answer any questions in more detail. In the meantime, as questions come up, please use the chat box, and I invite you to find that now and just let us know where you're hailing from. Uh, we've got a worldwide audience here today, so I'd love for people just to say hi and let us know where in the world you're coming from today. Uh, and uh, know that you will be able to unmute at the end. Uh, and if you do have pressing questions, uh, Curtis is monitoring not only the chat box, but you can raise your hand and we can unmute selectively, uh, presuming you don't have any significant background noise. So let's get started. Um, I'm really proud to introduce um, our guest today, he's a, an esteemed track pilot. He's been a really significant contributor to the foundations program. Uh, he has worked with our program as a level three track pilot, helping to educate and guide within our experience programs. He's a Canadian resident, lives on Lake Superior, and has a tremendous amount of polar experience on the ice, as they say, in, uh, in Antarctica as a traveler and a guide aboard uh, vessels there. And so, um, Zach, welcome to the show. Thanks a lot, Hans. Uh, happy to be here. Uh, it's always a good community to connect with people and share knowledge and, and adventures. And, and uh, yeah, I'm excited to talk about uh, paddling uh, in the winter. I've been getting out a lot recently. Uh, normally, <laughs> my, I would be down south on a ship uh, somewhere in another icy world. But now I'm in a, a really cold, icy world, and I know there's a lot of info going around about uh, people that are questioning, oh, can you go paddling in the winter and all that? So we're chatting with Hans about uh, doing a little chat about it and talking about some of the fundamentals and best practices around that. So that's what we're here to talk about today. And, Great, Zach. Uh, well, let's, yeah. let's back up a little bit and talk about your background. Now, you started paddling uh, oh, yeah. in, in early 2004, I understand, and you've learned a lot through um, expeditionary learning programs uh, around teaching and skills development. Uh, you are an accomplished uh, certified Paddle yes. Canada Level so, 2 instructor. Uh, yeah, ask, I... Ask, I, I I first got into paddling in like early spring up on Lake Superior in really cold conditions and just kind of went out there, uh, not fully prepared, but just kind of putting on what I'd wear in the winter and getting into the boat and not really realizing the consequences 
and, and got into paddling on the lake. And, and I have worked all over the world as a guide, outdoor educator with Outward Bound and other organizations. And uh, yeah, it's my passion. I've been on with track, uh, doing a bunch of stuff with them, testing gear and, and doing some specialty expeditions all over the world uh, since 2014. And now I have my own business in Thunder Bay doing expeditions all out all over called uh, uh, Such a Nice Day Adventures. So really excited to do that and, and share my passion with people and get them out on the water. Terrific, Zach. So just for a little bit of background information, what really drew you into kayaking and, uh, and into track? Uh, I think the, the whole idea of the, the life unleashed is, is pretty cool concept of like, yeah, the freedom to go anywhere exists in a kayak, you know? I, I never really felt that sense of freedom. You can get it hiking, just spending time in nature and connecting. But when you're, when you're in the boat, you can just float and go anywhere. And, and, and obviously you got to learn and progress in the different conditions and temperatures. But it's, a, it's an amazing fact. And that really drew me in. Uh, you could be self-contained in a boat for, for weeks or months with everything you could possibly need and live this simple life and, uh, and go anywhere. So that, that's what really drew me in. So. Terrific. Fantastic. Um, thanks for that. I'm going to put a little link in the chat room uh, for folks that uh, uh, are interested. We do have a, um, a blog post uh, that came out recently on a, uh, from a paddler e-zine uh, that features Zach Cruzens. I'm just going to put that in the chat. You can get a little bit more and I'll share with some more details on um, how to connect with Zach near the end of this. Um, so just give us a little update. Uh, Zach, where are you now? in the world uh right now i'm in thunder bay ontario uh i I've, i'm renting a place for the winter which uh is nice uh and and it's 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 in a nice part of town and i have my my small bubble of friends that i i'm, I'm spending time with and, and keeping healthy and active you know right. uh i've been getting out for a paddle once a week i've been eyeballing the weather and looking at uh at good conditions and and going out uh when it's feather well you, you can go out any day but <laughs> I, I'm choosing wisely and then running and being active and, and just enjoying life as best as I can. And uh, yeah, I'm looking Terrific. at maybe going to Mexico in the new year. I'm supposed to be best man at a friend's wedding in early January. So I am, uh, I, it just feels weird traveling right now, but uh, I am looking at going uh, and then quarantining when I come back. So uh, that's, that's on the books and on the radar. And I am looking at bringing uh, one of the track kayaks down so I can get so, into some warmer waters for a bit. So it sounds like you might get some paddling in Mexico if you can travel, but it sounds like your sights are really on from a kayaking perspective on uh, winter paddling on Lake Ontario and um, Lake Superior. Big I'm sorry, Lake, Lake Superior. <laughs> sorry about that on Lake Superior. And, um, uh, and then also uh, moving into your 2021 20, season with your business also on Lake Superior and in that area uh, as well. Yeah, um, for sure. I, I will make a note here is that um, uh, we have a bag, this particular bag here, uh, the Superior Hall bag we named after uh, in honor of Zach and his, uh, his, uh, his, his home break, as it were. Um, superior. So, uh, this is like Superior. Yeah. No terrific. Salt. So a couple of other There's acknowledgements no I want salt. to make. No a salt, other... no sharks, no, no, no worries. <laughs> no sharks, no breaker ways. Hey, so a couple other acknowledgements I want to make um, uh, on this subject is we do have Curtis Heron um, standing by in the chat space. He's uh, working at Track HQ in uh, Airdrie, Alberta. Uh, so thanks for your support, Curtis. A couple of folks I want to point out too is um, on the subject of cold water paddling, um, uh, I noticed Florian Piper is on here from the Netherlands and he works with um, uh, Oceanwide Expeditions and uh, is a partner of ours where we put together cold water trips. I'll tell you more about some of those trips, but we've got a couple of trips on the books um, for both uh, Northern Norway as well as Greenland coming up, which are both some cold water uh, expeditions. And so this kind of preparation will be, uh, can be essential for those types of trips. I'll tell you more about those at the end, but uh, welcome Florian. Uh, great to have you on board here. So let's jump in with, um, uh, with this. We're just talking about cold water paddling. Uh, why is that important, Zach? Uh, why is cold water paddling important? I think, I think there's a lot of, uh, it's a, it's a powerful environment to be in. So we're looking at like particularly places that are like, there's so many places you can paddle. There's in, whether you're in Southern Ontario or on the, uh, the Great Lakes or, or on the oceans of the world, 
uh, there, there's a lot less crowds, right? If you're, if you're looking to self-isolate, it's probably the best way to do it in the winter because you don't have the people out there. Uh, sometimes you get uh, really nice conditions uh, for calm, glassy, reflective can, uh, lights with the ice and the snow. And it's just unbelievable. I've been paddling out on Lake Superior and it's the same as in, in Antarctica almost with the, the, the ice formations and little uh, brash ice floating around and, and, the, and the sounds, like all your senses come alive more than ever. So I think that's really amazing uh, experience to and then to feel you feel that much more confident when you put all the skills together and weather interpretation to be like hey i'm going out on a good day in below well below freezing conditions and i'm i'm safe i'm satisfied i'm having a good time and you feel more alive the zest for life exists beyond anything anything else i haven't found in any other form of activity really so perfect so in many ways uh, it's an invigorating but also is a it represents the culmination of skills uh, yeah. to get there i'd like to also acknowledge all of you for being on this call and participating in this we've got uh we've got uh folks from sweden uh from burnaby british columbia from london ontario from victoria hey mike uh we've got illinois represented portland oregon um we've got hamburg uh represented uh the chicago suburbs zurich uh victoria bc uh chatham minnesota um Fantastic, great offering uh, and uh, worldwide representation here. I want to launch a poll just to get a better sense of, uh, uh, of what your experience is on the line here. So I'm going to launch a poll that really just asks the question is, what is your experience with cold weather or winter paddling? So we know how to orient this call a little bit. And so I invite you to participate in that poll. Let us know uh, where your paddling experience is. Maybe you haven't done it or even thought about it, like zero, zilch, none. Maybe you have thought about it, but you don't have the gear or the confidence to really take the next step. Um, or you've been paddling on day trips in the, in the winter time. Um, maybe you've even taken multi-day trips, or maybe like, you know, you're so, uh, completely there that you regularly sell yourself into a traditional skin on frame kayak and go hunt seals. And so um, that's the two ends of the continuum. Love to see where folks are. We've got um, 85 of you percent have voted and I just want to once again thank all of you for being here. So let's end this in five seconds and then we'll uh, move on and share this poll. So uh, Zach you should be able to see this. It looks like uh, the majority of folks have some experience paddling on day trips. Um, and it looks like we have an equal number who have either not done it or have uh, um, thought about it, but aren't really well set up for success. So uh, let's focus on that on this call. Let's really help set people up for success, answer questions about those kinds of things. I wanna start with um, Zach, what's the, what's the challenge, if you will, of winter paddling? I think the challenge is, is knowing uh like the right gear that your system that works because there's a lot of different systems so the best system that works for you and the the skills to feel confident and then to have the skills to make the judgment for the best weather interpretation and dynamics of the group so so because it's just that level higher of risk involved you want you want to be that much more careful and cautious so, so that's I get it so, involved. yeah so it's really it sounds like it's really cold and can seem uncomfortable <laughs> um i know that in winter conditions there's a variety of mechanisms that really strip the bo strip the body heat away and things can get really weird really quick um in winter conditions and cold temperatures with uh freezing extremities and uh slippery gear uh and paddlers can die from exposure and cold injuries um I know it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, what do you think are the opportunities that, uh, you know, winter paddling represents, Zach? Well, the, opp the opportunities I mentioned before, just to get out where there's a lot less crowds. Yep. Um, and, uh, and, and really kind of paddle year round and keep your skills sharp, you know? Like people are like, oh, I gotta get back in shape because it's, uh, it's the spring and I gotta get ready again for the next season. To, if you're, especially if you're gonna get into like longer trips and expeditions, you can kind of keep yourself in shape like by paddling regularly through the year, you know? And then also enjoying some of the dynamic waves and conditions that you might get on places like Lake Superior where you get the gales in November and stronger conditions 
that you can uh, test your skills and push your limits a little bit more. Okay, great. So you can avoid crowds in those popular spots in the off season. It sounds like uh, you can get out and connect with water and it sounds like you can really create more unique experiences uh, in the winter. Uh, but I love your idea of how you can stay strong and keep your skills sharp paddling year round um, with that. A couple of comments from the chat. Um, I just want to grab Michael Jackson's comment because he's just about to leave go paddling right now. Um, but he's super interested in, um, in what people recommendations are. And I do invite you to uh, look at some of the past episodes. Uh, Michael Jackson did a really great episode on Greenland paddling uh, and Greenland paddling techniques that really anchored the conversation in, um, in the origins of, um, of the activity. And so um, welcome, welcome, Michael. I hope you have a great day paddling out there. Um, we're gonna keep diving on this, but you can be able to watch the past episode and you can see what comes out of this. So have a great day on the water. So, yeah, um, Mike, thanks for coming out. <laughs> I worked with Mike down south uh, on, the, on the cruise ships there. So. Yeah, we got a couple of folks here. Um, uh, Zach in the chat room, uh, Zena from Walmart. Yeah, Zena's California. in the house. Awesome. It sounds like you <laughs> paddled with her in Antarctica in January. Yes. Um, and uh, yeah, and then the other comment that Rebecca makes is that for many folks on the West Coast where you're dealing with a Pacific current, um, it's always like winter paddling because it's always cold water. And so there's that element as well. So we'll get into defining that a little bit more, but the big idea here, it sounds like, is, um, is that there are inherent risks and discomfort of winter, of winter paddling, but they can be managed. So let's dive into that a little bit. And um, uh, by speaking about some of the considerations specifically for cold water paddling, and um, Zach, you and I discussed this a little bit, but it sounds like it's, it's gear requirements, it's kayaking skills development, it's yes. weather interpretation for forecasting conditions. Um, and then let's wrap it up then with um, a few best practices. How's that sound? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I think, uh, yeah, just get going ahead with the gear there. Uh, a lot of people are asked the question, uh, the biggest one that comes up, uh, wetsuit versus dry suit do i need that uh what what kind of layers do i wear um do spray skirts spr freeze to the combing in salt water like they do in fresh water <laughs> um things like that uh, i that I, yeah i can answer that question and say that it, it doesn't freeze in the same way because the the salt water needs to be well below freezing um i i, I find yeah, it doesn't freeze in the same way when I, it's, when I get that salty weather. That's my, from my experience down in below freezing temperatures. Great. So, Zach, just for context, you were reading that question from the chat room. Somebody asked about that specifically. Yeah, I, ju I just saw that pop up. So, I was like, I'm going to close that so I don't, I don't get sidetracked with it. But um, <laughs> I appreciate that, Dana. That's, it's a good question. But it, so, um, it, it, you got to think about the right gear, right? The, the, are you going to freeze up? Uh, like, what do you need, right? Um, so, I've been so in... Let's, let's, so, start, so let's, think, start, let's start with immersion gear, uh, the yeah. big picture that you were talking about. Um, well, yeah, well, wetsuit versus dry suit is the biggest question, right? So yes. I, I was like, oh, dry suit, I can never afford one of those. I'm never going to use it. So I always wore like thermals, wetsuit, and rain gear, and it's fine. You know, it, it depends. And maybe Hans, if you throw up that chart, the water temperature chart there. Uh, so it's just a, a, a little, can you guys see that? Yeah, just did a little screen share. Yep. I'm not seeing it full here, but anyway. Uh, so dressing for cold, yeah, it's a chart looking at water temperature uh, from like the hypothermia risk of low to extreme. And, and, and if it's like above 15 degrees Celsius, you're, you're kind of just dressing for the weather. And then you're looking at wetsuit versus dry suit in like 13 to 15 degrees Celsius, 55, 59 Fahrenheit going down to like higher suit. You can never like say you have to wear a dry suit, but we recommend. And then below like 45, 7 degree Celsius, weather you're looking at like dry suit strongly recommended mainly because it's got gaskets on the neck wrists built-in booties you can stay dry you can layer appropriately underneath and be a lot more comfortable than with a wetsuit and terrific also, curtis give me a thumbs up can you see that graphic that's up yeah no uh oh no uh jim I can, can you see, see the graphic that's up yeah jim can see it okay Right. Uh, it's just a, a basic chart there. I, I think it's off like paddleboston.com or something that they've got okay. like some of the community paddles that, that go paddling a lot. They, uh, they use, uh, 
they they've studied this and analyzed it and there's like a cold water boot camp site that talks about emergency first aid and hypothermia but the risk of hypothermia is greater so you want to protect yourself from that so that's why the gear is the most important and having the right layers typically i will wear thermal long john synthetic or wool with a fleece pant and then like one or two pairs of wool socks maybe a neoprene sock over top and then a booty that's two or three sizes bigger that, that like a lot of people don't think about that, but you want a loose fitting booty uh, that's going to insulate your feet. Cause that's the first thing that's going to get cold. And then with your hands, you're looking at, a fo- uh, there's a whole bunch of different uh, like glacial gloves makes a really nice neoprene glove that where you can have like the grip on the fingers. There's some uh, brands of gloves that don't really grip the paddle that well. And the best in my opinion is using pogies that with, and if it's really cold, you use like a light fingerless, fingerless glove underneath and then that uh, protects your hands totally and you have a really good uh, grip on the paddle but that, if you right, were to Zach, submerse and leave from that you your hands are not protected so it's yeah, Zach, uh, so for people who don't know maybe what pogies are just back up a little bit just describe uh what a pogie is it, it's a it's a like a hand cover that goes completely over your hand and, and grips onto the paddle like velcros onto the paddle so it's just a hand cover and you can have bare hands or like a light glove on underneath and get uh, full insulation protection. For like a paddles. shell for your gloves even. Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. So uh, what I'm getting from, uh, from, from the, the, the immersion gear conversation, it sounds like really understanding how to dress best for the water temperature uh, and deciding, uh, assessing whether it's a dry suit or a wetsuit scenario um, and, uh, and moving into an awareness about the water temperature to make those decisions. That's kind of for your core body. It sounds like you've also identified that you need to layer appropriately under that and to also think most importantly about your extremities, your hands, your feet, uh, with gloves and pogies and with your boots, make sure that you leave extra room in your boots for um, uh, there to be some air insulation for additional warmth. Did I get that right? Yeah, no, totally. I, and, and it's about the individual system because one person could try something and it might be different for others. Uh, often I find I, I go paddling with other people in winter conditions. And when I say winter conditions, I'm thinking like the extreme uh, below seven degrees, 45 Fahrenheit water temperatures and air temperatures uh, in uh, just above and below freezing. I've, I've had a number of people be too hot because they wore too many layers and then you sweat and, you, and then you can get cold. So you got to make sure you have those wicking layers on the top and bottoms with insulation of like fleece uh, and, and stay away from the cotton, which I think is pretty common sense for a lot of people here that have paddled either in summer or whatever, right? You get cold easy when you don't have uh, right. that. Yeah. So layer. Zach, it sounds, like, it sounds like one thing you're also recommending here is that, uh, you know, there's no one-stop shop. Everyone's different. Everyone has different uh, metabolism rates and uh, will get cold sooner or later than others. So it sounds like one of the things you're suggesting is to really go out and, and test the gear in the water, uh, in the conditions you might be paddling in to ensure that it works before you're in a more committing situation. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. Now, what yeah. about the head? What, 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 what yeah, are your recommendations so, for gear for the head? Uh, the head, uh, I didn't mention, but you can wear, there's neoprene skull caps, there's full neoprene balaclavas, there's like aquatherm balaclavas, there's just warm hats, toques, beanies, whatever you call it, and a buff. I tend to just wear, if I'm, if I'm going out and I'm not planning on flipping, which is most of the time, I, I am going to wear a buff or maybe two buffs like to protect my neck and face. And then I'll wear a, a toque or a beanie and I'll be pretty comfortable. Sometimes maybe I have a, a, a GoPro strap on over top or something, or maybe I have a helmet if I'm going in surf that I can wear uh, like a thinner toque underneath that. If you're going in and you're practicing rolling and, and even in like the spring on Lake Superior, I'm wearing like a full neoprene like balaclava and as, as little skin as possible exposed to the water. And that that's going to lead into the, the whole hypothermia thing again in the one ten one rule, which uh, I don't know. I don't think I have a screenshot of that, but uh, so you guys might've heard that if you've done like any sort of ACA Paddle Canada training with, uh, with, with uh, that, but essentially you have one minute where you have this cold shock response, you know, where your body's like, Whoa. And, 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 and the le- less skin you have exposed, uh, the purpose of wearing that immersion gear is going to help you uh, limit that, that cold response shock that happens. And then you have 10 minutes 
before um, you're losing uh, feeling in your, in your fingers and, and arms and hands and, and legs and, and, and a low momentum. And then you can go in after an hour, one hour, you can go in the hypothermia and potentially risk unconsciousness. So that's, that's the one ten one rule, which is kind of simple to think about when you're breaking down the risk factor of, of uh, going out in the cold water environment. So the one ten one rule. Yes. Uh, just in very simple terms, just explain that one more time. Yeah. So, so one, you have one minute of like, you have a, a, your cold, wa cold water response. So you have like a shock when you hit the water. Okay. And this is like kind of thinking you're going in the, in cold water without any immersion or with immersion. And, and then you got 10 minutes before you're being exposed to cold water where you're having trouble moving your fingers and your feet and your, and your, and then your arms and you become weaker. And then after one hour, you're, you could go into unconscious hypothermia and, and you have a life threatening situation going on. So that's like, that's the general rule of like being exposed without immersion gear. So that's the reason why you wear it. So if you do go in the water, you limit that cold water response shock by less ex skin exposed, and then you are going to be insulated. So you're not going to lose the feeling in your hands and, and mobility in your hands and legs. So you can hopefully get yourself back in the boat with the skills you have to recover yeah. and you're not going to go into hy hypothermia, right? Okay, good. So it sounds like data suggests that um, uh, if you are in cold water immersion, that, uh, um, within a minute, you might have some shock response. Uh, within 10 minutes, you might start to lose dexterity and your function in your extremities. And then uh, within an hour, certainly uh, most of the population would be uh, at risk of extreme hypothermia, which um, is a, you know, the next step is. Yeah, no, absolutely. Really consequential. It's, okay, it's, uh... great. Awesome. So um, uh, that's, it sounds like that's the, that's the gear for, um, uh, you know, kind of specifically for ourselves. What other kind of boat gear, expedition gear do you recommend for cold water paddling? Uh, I think I didn't mention, but to always bring like uh, a dry bag in your boat with like a fresh change of clothes, uh, warm layers, insulating, extra hat, extra gloves, things like that, that you might want to have accessible in a day hatch or what at least you have them with you so if somebody does get in the water then you can change clothes also bring like a hot thermos snacks energy like calories are always good right so uh, those type of things and obviously like the standard first aid kit maybe emergency communication thinking about like cell phone batteries like dying uh, really easily and if you had to communicate you might not want to rely on your cell phone so just being aware of like how far you're going and, and like what alternative communication measures you have if your cell phone battery dies and something serious happens. So. Okay, so um, basically for, uh, for winter gear, <clears throat> you would carry kind of a, a rescue gear bag, like a ditch bag. Um, it sounds like that you would include a change of clothes, maybe a sleeping bag for a hypo wrap, um, maybe some insulation. Um, I've always taken a, th you know, a thermos of hot water along with the snack you mentioned um, so that I could, I could rehydrate with warm water really quickly. Um, it sounds like the other thing you I illustrated here is that there's a real need to move quickly with rescues. So maybe exchanging your, your inflatable paddle float for a solid paddle float to save time. Maybe um, enhancing your uh, bilge pump with also a baler that you can get more water out faster those kinds of things um, would be. Yeah, exactly. Uh, For the, just things to think about with that, that like time efficiency, if you were to capsize, cause like, obviously, Oh yeah, I'm so confident. I, I might, uh, I'm not going to capsize. I'm going out. I don't need to, I'll just wear my winter coat and I'll be fine. And I, I've seen it happen with really competent uh, seasoned paddlers. I've gone out with them and they're joking around and then all of a sudden they're in the water and they are very cold. So, <laughs> um, yeah. So and, within, uh, within 10 minutes, we could start to lose dexterity in our extremities, exactly, which yeah. would also slow us down in any sort of reentry exercise or getting our spray skirt back on or even handling or recovering our paddle. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Great. You know, one addition that Rebecca is making from the chat room here, um, is, a, is a rule. And I haven't heard this before. Um, but I'm just going to share it sort of unvetted. Um, uh, is that uh, the 120 degree rule. Uh, she suggested if you add together the air temperature and the water temperature, and if it's lower than 120, the risk of hypothermia is moderate, and below 100, the risk of hypothermia is high. Okay, 
I, so I feel like those, I've heard that before. Those temperatures will be in Fahrenheit, so it's in a very Fahrenheit, American, yeah. American reference. But um, um, Her uh, Curtis Heron has restated the one, the one ten one rule in the chat box, so you can check that out as well. Um, terrific. Uh, let's um, let's dive into the next subject and let's move on to skills development. Uh, yeah. What's so the, I think we just we touched on it a little bit, um, and uh, and I and I I think I just see the flow plan. I could talk about that and and having the skill and knowledge to be prepared. The one other thing, like gears, like have a flow plan, talk to somebody, and then uh, and and be prepared so you know where you're going to some degree, depending on how far you're going out, and then knowing what your skill level of your group is is the biggest importance because you want to limit that time factor and going out with. I'd say at least three people is probably the best because then if something happens, one person can stay and take care of that person and somebody else could potentially go for help. Like extreme scenarios we're thinking about, right? But knowing what your skill level is and not pushing yourself, like being pretty conservative with your decisions. So uh, Hans has this chart up here. Um, uh, can you guys all see it? I can only see the one, one corner of it right now. Zach, uh, I just brought up to help put this in kind in the context is you had mentioned the, um, uh, you know, you'd mentioned stages of learning. Yes, um, the stages of learning. And, exactly. And, and so, it sounds like the first skill to develop is just the awareness of where your skills are. Um, so let's put this into context of a very common tool called stages of learning uh, to help us unpack that a little bit, not only for our own skills, but for the skills of folks who may be paddling with. You've mentioned that a couple of things that are important with skills development is uh, to paddle with other people. So having awareness of your own skill, uh, as well as those others with you is one of the awarenesses you need to build. So before you can really grow skills, you need to first develop the skill of awareness. <laughs> no, absolutely. And, and awareness and all this goes towards building good judgment. And, and that's what it really comes down to. So you can judge uh, what, what, what you, what you're doing, what you're getting yourself into. So everybody kind of, if you're starting from like birth or, or not really getting into it, you're going to be unconsciously incompetent. Like you're lacking that awareness, you know, you don't know really what your skills and, and you're unconsciously incompetent, but then if you if you become a little bit more conscious of that, and you're like, hey, you know what? I'm a beginner here. I'm gonna not go out today, or I'm I'm gonna only stay close to shore because I'm conscious that I don't have the competency to like rescue myself proficiently. My role's not super good, or I'm not. I don't have all the right gear. You're gonna have some kind of lemon to be like you're aware of that, and and you're consciously incompetent, which is super good to have and, and be, be fluid with that, especially with the people you're going with. Yeah. Uh, when so, you're on, so it's, so it's really critical. So it sounds like if you're, if you're engaging in any, any sort of new activity where the risks are increased, uh, then uh, the part where you don't know what you don't know is a really vulnerable space. Uh, yeah. And, and then you could be unconsciously competent. It's like just naturally know that you're more competent than you might not realize. Right. And, and, but everybody wants to get to the consciously competent. So you're able to use that skill and, uh, and when, when needed. And, and that's where the judgment comes in with the absolute height and big, big picture awareness, which is the best place to be, particularly if you're winter paddling. Okay. So the progression here for folks that are new to winter paddling is first identify uh, what you don't know and move yourself from the sense of unconscious incompetence um, into understanding where your limitations are, where you are competent, where you're not competent, um, and then working to build, to build those skills so you do have a degree of conscious competence so that you can apply those skills dis even though you need to focus on it a lot uh, and it has to be top of mind, uh, then those skills need to be practiced in a way so that they are more accessible um, to bring them into a, a state of conscious competence. I get that. And so it sounds like if we're also very advanced, um, we could have a possibly a sense of unconscious competence where we lose touch a little bit with limitations of folks we're paddling with in this space because they may not have that and we may not be attuned to that because it's so fluent for us. Did I get that right? 
Yeah, it, I think that's uh, that's spot on. It's the complacency is what it gets into with un unconscious competency. And I think a lot of us who, if like forty five percent people here saying they're they're going winter paddling anyway, I know you guys are skilled out there. You know what's going on, but having that awareness of of that unconscious competency is super important because you could just it can just fly over your head, and then you or you're just going out, and you might not realize that somebody you're competent and you're 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 not as conscious of everybody in your group, but if you're conscious of competent, it's the best position to be in. Okay, great. For, uh, um, that's fantastic. That. So the first step really in skills development is first building awareness uh, and then identifying what skills you need to develop um, toward that. What's the next step in terms of uh, skills development you recommend? Well, I think we talked about the speed of recovery and, and knowing that you have uh, your rescue skills dialed or your role dialed. So but with, so you don't have to go into that 10 minute uh, of being in the water and losing dexterity type uh, situation. Right. Okay. And uh, so, and, and, and that'll have, you'll have the right level of confidence to go out. Right. So I know people are, are conservative of like the type of boat they might paddle, you know, if they're going out, they're going to, you should go with a boat that you're, you're comfortable with, you know how it's going to perform and it is the is one idea. So you know that you can have that super quick speed of recovery, uh, speed of recovery uh, and, yep. uh, and not put yourself in those situations. Avoidance is like the best when possible. So. Okay, great. So, so far it sounds like um, uh, the keys in terms of skills development is a, just have awareness about what, where your skills are and bring attention to where, uh, your competence is. Um, second is to really know your boat and uh, how it works specifically with the gear you'd be wearing in winter time uh, because you know a wet exit with a full dry suit and a bunch of layers can be different or a little more challenging than uh, if you're just in your board shorts and and barefooted. <laughs> I get Absolutely. that. Yeah. And then it sounds like the other thing is really focusing skills so that you are clear on your speed of recovery and practicing those skills, not only for your own self rescue, but assisting others and also uh, being assisted are all important understandings to know where your uh, skill set is in different conditions. Yeah. Absolutely. How about other systems? What other, you know, uh, uh, proficiencies do you think are really critical? Well, we get into that uh, judgment skill uh, development, which really leads into like weather interpretation, you know, having the skill to, to know how to obtain a proper marine forecast of like what's going on, looking at the weather, just knowing that it's December and this morning was minus 15, but it's going to be a high of minus two. I'm speaking in Celsius here uh, just to, to get a sense of, uh, uh, of how cold it is knowing that and then there's no wind in the forecast so did you want to say anything else on skill before i jump into the the weather or? no i don't think so i think uh but i think what you're getting at in terms of skills is like the first important thing is to build your awareness and then to build your skills and then have a proficiency with uh with all the moving parts um and the criteria would be certainly navigation towing systems um, speed of recovery with rescues, those are all critical pieces to have in play because your ability with them in the summertime uh, may be different than your ability with them uh, in sub, you know, sub freezing temperatures. Yeah, absolutely. Right. It's and so let's unpack risk, the, so. let's, un let's go ahead and unpack the weather interpretation a little bit. You mentioned wind. When we're yes. looking at wind, what do you look for exactly when you're looking at a, uh, at a, at a wind forecast? So I, I'm looking at wind speed and direction hundred percent. And, and, and if it's coming offshore or onshore, so like for Lake, for Lake Superior example, I'm up on like the Northwest shore of the lake. So if I get like wind coming from the South, I know that that is going to build what's called fetch. So you guys are probably familiar with that. Um, as paddlers, some, maybe some people not so much, but it's how waves build over time and can, can create waves by wind uh, direction and speed, which is created by barometric pressures. And that I'm not going to get into all the synoptics of that, but uh, essentially you're going to uh, wind speed and direction is the key. Cause if it's coming offshore off the lake, I know it's going to build waves and that's going to affect my, my conditions. So I could be in a protected group of islands and be okay. And, but maybe if it's coming from the North, 
off the, then I know I can just go along the North shore of the lake and I'm going to be more protected than I would if it was coming from the South. Cause I'm not going to have that wave development through that wind direction and speed. Okay, great. So, so there's number two, one to look at. Yeah. So it sounds like there's two factors of the wind. One is wind is one of the, one of the elements that can strip body heat from us uh, and, and further drop temperatures. It sounds like the other consideration with wind is that it can be another risk factor if it's blowing offshore versus onshore. Um, and you've identified uh, fetch here. Uh, I'll, I'll further define that a little bit. It's the distance that the wind has to blow uh, unobstructed across the surface, wherein the wind imparts energy into the, into the water that uh, is represented by a wave frequency. Uh, and yeah. That can, yeah. Over uh, open water, right? You go to the West coast yeah. of Canada or East coast, you're going to see waves if you go to uh, but maybe some days you don't get waves if the wind's blowing from the other direction because you don't have that fetch over that, that distance over time for the wind to build. Yeah. So, yeah, and, and, and as you said, Hans, about wind affecting how cold it is, it, that, the, the wind chill factor is a huge thing to consider in the winter. And, and I don't want to go out. I don't like to go out if it's colder than, or it's windier than five. Unless I'm going out to surf or something for like a shorter period of time, which is a different type of... Uh, uh, mentality to get your headspace into. Whereas I'm kind of hunting for like good weather and really enjoying my time on the water in the winter uh, as, as a goal of getting out most of yeah. the time. So I don't want that cold wind on my face. I, I like it to be calm and sunny and it's going to be much more pleasant to be out. So I'm looking at that and that ties right into temperature being like, what's the highs and lows of the day uh, in conjunction with that wind? Cause then you can see, you can make the decision on where you're going and how long you're going out for. And uh, cause every time I go out for, if I go out for more than two hours, three hours, I feel this chill and, uh, and, and, and you got to warm up, you know? Cool. So um, let's... the precipitation is a huge thing. It, yeah. the, the, the third point there is, is precipitation in conjunction with that. Cause it's, it could be snowing. It could be raining. It could be freezing, raining. Is it sunny? Is it clear? Is it cloudy? All that's going to affect the temperature and how you feel out there and how you're going to dress. Yeah. Terrific. Awesome. Um, a couple of things around dressing is Brad Atchison is putting some notes in the chat box here. He's included a photograph of himself in the deer group, which is uh, on the West Coast near where I live. Uh, but you can see kind of an example of a, um, of a fully suited up, um, winter paddler, although the PFD is unzipped, Brad. Uh, we'll talk about that one later. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but thanks for sharing that image. That's a great example. And um, uh, also, he really kind of broke down a checklist, if you will, of some of the, uh, the gear and um, the clothing that he uses in uh, cold temperatures. So, um, so in terms of weather interpretation, Zach, I'm getting this, is that uh, pay particular attention to the wind speed direction and the potential of fetch. Sounds like the temperature is really crucial. Um, and there can be differences between the air temperature and the water temperature, of course. And then it sounds like precipitation um, is another factor that can be super important because when you add wet to the cold, it can also uh, strip additional uh, heat and also generate ice uh, in, you know, on our decks and on our gear. Uh, and it sounds like overall, Absolutely. overall, the weather interpretation is critical for relevance to the route we're actually going to be paddling. So understanding how that wind temperature might relate to um, protection that might exist upon your route uh, or exposures as a result of that. Um, so I get all that. Awesome. 100%. Thank you. And, and, and with temperature... And, and where, how far into the winter you are, you, you got to look at access, you know, because I know in the Great Lakes, it freezes up. And even I went out the other day, I was out for like an hour and a half and we came back and, and the beach was frozen for like 10, 15, like 10 meters going in. If you guys saw that little video I posted, it was like, whoa, we're frozen in. Nothing you can't break through. But if you go out a little bit longer, if the wind's kind of blowing, um, towards the shore, it could blow in, the wind and waves could blow in ice and, and potentially block you. And that's something that happens in Antarctica a lot with uh, icebergs and ice just kind of getting blown into bays. And then it's not possible for the ship to get in to access some of the beautiful landings. So it's the same thing on any of the Great Lakes, uh, maybe not on the ocean, the West Coast, 
because it's you don't really get the icebergs there and stuff you just get cold water but the ice factor in the great lakes is a big factor of where i can go so i look at like daily satellite imagery there's a cool link for the great lakes that shows like how much ice cover there is and and where like maybe wind and ice has blown uh access to certain spots where i can actually get off and go which is the biggest strategy uh to look at in conjunction with all the wind temperature and the precipitation levels yeah, cool. Awesome. So it sounds like really for, for someone to get to get into more wintertime paddling um, to kind of start to pull this together is really making sure that the, the that you've got the right gear and that it works and that you test it um, with special consideration to the core body temperature and then your extremities, hands, feet and head. Um, second, with skills development, it sounds like it's super critical that you first build the awareness around where your competencies are, both for yourself and your paddling partners, and then to work specifically on developing those um, and making sure that the pieces that you attempt to go paddling with are all things you've tried before. And then you can further minimize risk by uh, elevating the speed of your recovery of re-entry in the event of a capsize, not only for yourself, um, but assisted, but also in assisting others. Um, and the more proficient you are at any of the associated skills, uh, the more you can minimize that risk um, going out into these conditions. And the other big factor in terms of being able to minimize risk is awareness around what the, what the forecasting is, what the weather conditions might be, and how those translate into effects on you as a paddler in terms of wind, temperature, precipitation, and their combined relevance to the route. Yeah, 100%. great. Awesome. Lot, Thanks for that. A lot Zach. of information here. So that's a lot of information. So let's just uh, identify really quickly. What are some? Uh, I'm, I'm, I know there's some best practices coming up here in the chat room. Like um, somebody's mentioned here, you know, leave a float plan. Tell somebody where you're going um, when you expect to return. Let's identify just some of the best practices that you use, Zach, as you're moving into a, a cold water paddling day. What comes up for you that's different than when you're you know, maybe considering an afternoon paddle in the summer. Well, I'm looking at access, like where can I safely put in and safely get back to? I'm not going to go as far off. Like generally, like I've done like overnight winter camps, but it's uh, like where I'm, I'm doing expedition style paddling, but I, I tend to only go out in like the warmest part of the day or go out for like less than two or three hours. I think I went out for like four hours or five or six hours once or twice and i'm just like that you just from being in the boat no matter how many layers i'm on if i'm out exposed to that like wind and chill of of, of below freezing temperatures you're cold you know and, and you got to get out and like at least have some warm soup move around a bit and then uh and then keep going so i'm always conscious of how far i go i, I don't go as far i i i'm gonna go out and be safe. I'm, I'm going to maybe, I'm going to tell somebody where I'm going. You can make a little bit of a passage plan or whatever you want to call it. Uh, you don't need to no, notify the Coast Guard by any means, and that's a big boo-boo. But if you're just going going out, just tell a friend so somebody knows if they don't hear from you, you're not back, then they know something's happened. Because you never know, like, no matter how safe you are, it's good to know, hey, cool, I'm going out paddling. I'm going to be back by this time. And, uh, and, and just a few little tidbits of like where you're going how long you're going to go out for who's going out it doesn't have to be super detailed you can just communicate and and, and know your backup of, of like hey your cell phone might freeze or and the battery might die so if that happens and you need and you're out longer than expected how are you going to get a hold of somebody or are you going to insulate that foam into like some gear inside your layers so you're comfortable and you can access it easy Th things like that you got to think about with your systems right Okay, great. Um, so uh, uh, I'm getting all that. It sounds like um, uh, collectively best practice would be conservative in terms of your route scope and distance. Um, it sounds like making sure there's accessibility uh, if you need to get off or you need assistance. It sounds like going together is a, is a tremendous best practice. And then it sounds like to really make and share a clear passage plan and have some sort of communication plan that's attached with that. Um, You've also identified really dressing for the water temperatures uh, as well as um, developing your skills so you can go with confidence uh, into those things to allow you to uh, be more relaxed and calm uh, that uh, leads to better decision making and judgment. Did I get all that right? 
Yeah, for sure. Like the type of paddling I'm doing, I'm like, I'm going out and then I'm like, okay, who's hot tub and sauna am I going to afterwards? You know, like, you know, <laughs> cause it's, it's just like nice to, that's what's enjoyable. Right. Uh, so you can, uh, you can go and warm up afterwards instead of like knowing that if I'm going camping somewhere, I'm going to go to a place where I'm going to, I'll look at the weather. I'll go out somewhere where I know I have like a sauna to warm up and stay yeah. warm and dry. And, and that's, that would be a determining factor for sure. Like I wouldn't want, I wouldn't go and camp without that. <laughs> awesome. Uh, keep, keeping it real. Awesome. Um, hey, so um, uh, let's bring this. I certainly want to thank you, Zach, for your contribution here. Uh, I'd like to, in the closing moments here, two things um, is I'd like to certainly let folks know how to get in touch with you. Um, uh, I'd like to you know, share some resources that track has for folks that are interested in skills development. Uh, I'd also like, um, I don't know if Florian's up for this, but we've got some experiences coming up here that I'd love to unmute um, Florian and just give him a really high level look of what some of those are that folks can engage with in the near future. So um, let's start with just a uh, with you, Zach, just want to, you know, thank you as a, as a track pilot and a subject matter expert here. You got, I think you've delivered some real value to this community and helped to encourage people to possibly expand their comfort zone and uh, engage in paddling a little more year round. Um, I'm going to put a couple of um, uh, links here, Zach, but how do you prefer people to kind of get in touch with you uh, with questions or ideas? Uh, I think social media, like my name's displayed on the screen. You can find me on Facebook. Oh, Hans has it all there. Yeah, it's, it's the easiest way or email uh, info at such a nice day dot com or my website. If you if you want, uh, I'm happy to like I'll, I'll go above and beyond like answering any questions or helping you out or uh, even going out on the water with you and uh, and figuring it all out. Happy to 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 help people out and inspire people to get out and do more things. So. And so, Zach, you've got a business called Such a Nice Day. You do education and guided trips. Yeah, tours. so Such a Nice Day, Sand Adventures. Uh, I'm, I'm working on developing a bunch more programs, like expeditions and skills course progressions from like beginner, intermediate, advanced, uh, out on Lake Superior. And eventually, I'll go into inter international markets more. I have a lot of contacts. I, I, that's the other thing. I have contacts all over the world for any type of paddling. Uh, once travel opens up more, but yeah. it's, uh, yeah, I really enjoy this place. I've gotten to know it. It's, it's, uh, it's gotten under my skin and, and I, I want to share getting out on Lake Superior with people and I'm developing youth camps and, and getting kids out and have a 34 foot Voyager canoe recently just bought a Zodiac as well. Uh, so we can do like shuttle programs, a base camp where not as extreme paddling necessarily needs to happen, but we can shuttle boats and gear out to remote base camp Island and, and have unique experiences. So excited to share that with people for sure. And just Perfect. Zach, I'm going to, I'm going to add to that a little bit and, and track this past, uh, summer when we had to pull back on some of our camps and tours, we did a little bit of a market test and we built a, a group virtual coaching program that ran in conjunction with our track foundations online learning program uh, and track pilot Cole did that and uh, we had a tremendous amount of uh, interest and support um, we ran three cohorts through that to develop the content and the programming and now we've launched that as a um, as a program called the sea kayak skills accelerator and it's uh, it's now one-on-one -on -one virtual coaching uh, over an extended period of time with one of our track pilots. And Zach Cruzens, you're, uh, you're up as one of the options for a, um, a virtual one-on-one -on -one coach uh, in this space. So I just wanna put it uh, in the chat room, I just wanna put a link there uh, directly to my email address. If folks are interested in pairing up with a one-on-one -on -one, uh, coaching opportunity one, with one of our level three track pilots, email me directly at hans at trackkayaks.com and we can uh, present to you a couple of different uh, level three track pilots that could work with you one-on-one -on -one in a virtual context to help you with skills development, uh, to open up avenues like winter paddling uh, or even foundational, but they'll be, uh, they're basically will go along in a really customized fashion and follow the, uh, the free track foundations program. And I'll also put that link in for folks that are, um, that are coming here and want to look at our online program. It's free to everyone. Um, track found it's foundations.trackkayaks.com. And uh, so those are a couple of resources. Uh, we also have 
uh, coming right up, we do have a um, Keys to Avoiding Deep Trouble podcast with track pilot Matt Pruis next. Uh, and he'll be doing expedition planning uh, as a context uh, to, for the more advanced paddlers, but he'll touch on some of these subjects as well. Um, the other thing that I'll just add in here is I invite Florian to certainly um, uh, unmute if you'd like to. We do have on the books a couple of track experiences coming up that are really cold water oriented uh, with his outfit, uh, both in Greenland and Northern Norway. And of course, they're subject to kind of COVID rules as they relax coming up here. But Florian, welcome to the call and I invite you to, uh, uh, to open up your mic. Uh, hi Hans, hi Zach, hi everyone. I didn't know, I didn't expect that I have a speech uh, part in this uh, <laughs> presentation tonight, but uh, now you give me the opportunity, uh, I'll take a minute. My name is Florian um, and I'm an Arctic program coordinator and planner for ocean-wide expeditions. Uh, we are a company based in the Netherlands and we own and operate uh, ice strengthened vessels. And at some point uh, last year, we had that brilliant idea uh, to team up with a company like uh, Trek to find uh, industry leading uh, equipment uh, that we could use on our ships, on our mother vessels and uh, go out with the gear and the kayakers into very remote locations. So we are a means of transportation to get the bunch of kayakers in that case into very remote locations and that's where you get started. And then together with Hans, uh, in particular, we developed uh, that uh, kayak skills progression camp and uh, we hoped uh, for a maiden voyage uh, uh, in March, but unfortunately, Corona came in between. And then uh, we hoped again for another maiden uh, trip for next year, March, but uh, we gave in and we thought uh, we'll uh, pause for uh, the winter uh, because of the Corona situation also in uh, the northern uh, uh, part of Europe. And uh, so we are looking far ahead now to 2022. So if any one of you want to come and join uh, Kayak Skills Progression Camp with us, Oceanwide Expeditions together in cooperation with Track uh, Kayaks, uh, please, uh, I want to uh, draw your attention to uh, the dates in um, March, April, 2022. So there's a little uh, time in between now and then to save up some money and get your gear ready. Uh, we have, um, talking about the gear, we have the gear on board. Uh, we purchased kayaks uh, from Trek. Uh, so we have uh, five single seat kayaks uh, on board. So four kayakers um, plus one kayak guide. And we hope for Zach to, to rejoin us. Uh, we hope for you to, to be on board in uh, March, but we, we didn't manage, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, but we'll repeat that for sure. And uh, fingers crossed. And then uh, we'll uh, get you out there. And isn't it a nice idea of just listening to your presentation here and all your knowledge that you have? But then if you're a beginner, I count myself uh, uh, um, uh, as a beginner. Uh, and I always thought, wouldn't it be nice to uh, go out there for a week, travel to a nice destination, and then in the same time, meet like-minded people and the expert guides who introduce you to the equipment to the gear and to the skills as well. So you go through a skills progression camp and you learn from scratch and then you take it up uh, step by step as far as you want to go, as far as you can do it. Um, I can't do it in my parts of the world here. It will be terribly complicated because you would need to have uh, the right gear, the right adv advice. You, you, you cannot start from bottom um, if you don't have that kind of awareness. You don't go out just by yourself, uh, but it's much better to go along uh, with uh, other people who also want to learn. And then when um, we have those kayakers on board, uh, um, they are well protected. We have the kayak guides who give the instructions. Uh, we also have a safety boat uh, driver who will accompany the group of kayakers. So if somebody feels tired or just want to have a break or just uh, want to step out of the activity, they can do that just anytime. So safety is paramount uh, with uh, whatever we do. It is cold water uh, environment up there in the northern Norway. So we're looking at temperatures of uh, around uh, five degrees Celsius. So that refers to around to 41 uh, Fahrenheit, uh, if not mistaken. So according to your presentation and the introduction earlier, it would refer to 
extremer temperatures, so dry suit is recommended. We have that gear on board. So we um, uh, uh, provide every kayaker who comes on board uh, um, with head to toe equipment, dry suit, uh, hat, and you name it, and the booties. Uh, the pogies and, and everything that just had been mentioned in this presentation. And then you try, you test it, whether you like it, maybe you don't like it, maybe you want to progress on your skills. It is a door um, that you can open into the world of kayaking. So we definitely want to do that. And we're happy to do that with Truck in the Future. That was awesome. my speech, <laughs> spontaneous Florian. speech. Awesome, Florian, thank you so much. Uh, you know, I, what, what I'm really excited about your program is uh, okay. I, love the, I love the really small uh, ship of the uh, converted sailing schooner uh, for the Northern Norway program. Uh, and the second program we have that's gonna be in 2022 is the, is the Greenland program. It's where the kayak was born. And Florian, I don't know if you've seen this yet, but we just launched this week a new skin design if we call it the origin series. And we've actually uh, done some original artwork on this kayak skin that really is reflective of our interpretation of the origins of uh, the Greenlanders uh, paddling out in you know, subsistence kayaking, if you will, hunting seals, selling themselves in, uh, getting into the coldest water in the North Atlantic. So um, yeah, thanks for a little bit of that, Florian. Really appreciate it. and. Um, uh, those are available. You can check them out on the website uh, as we get closer to 2022. Uh, once again, I did add the link to the um, Sea Kayak Skills Accelerator. That link actually pertains to the group program, but we've moved into uh, really offering that one-on-one -on -one with more of our elite coaches and in a more customized fashion. So you can get a ch chance to look at that, see what's involved, but we will customize it for you. Um, and uh, uh, but you could, that's one place you can put your name and we'll contact you if you're interested. So um, it, in closing, I want to invite people to show up for the three keys to, uh, or the keys to avoiding deep trouble. It's our next podcast, not unlike this. It's designed uh, for folks that have a little bit more um, experience. And uh, the other thing is that um, uh, we've also got wellness equals water. Uh, that really speaks to and explores uh, the impact of being in, on, and around water has on your health. So I uh, want to welcome you, invite you to participate in those. Zach, once again, thanks so much. Really appreciate it. Um, and at this point, I think we're officially hanging out. So if we want to open up mics, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to unmute yourself and uh, let's Eddie out here and have a conversation about some of the things Zach's introduced. <laughs>